I want to tell you something. About how many have been here for the first time? This is your first time. The first timers are supposed to be assigned to the presidential suite. Did that happen to you? <laughs> your, your, your big flat screen TV, is it working all right? <laughs> How about the room service? Well, to tell you the truth, this is a 40-hour marathon meeting. We start at 7 on, on Friday evening and at 11 on Sunday morning, and we don't leave any time for sleep. Just to be sure that happens, we've got a snore in every bed, in every cabin. So keep that in mind. How many Baptists are here? How many Baptists are here? Raise your hand. Would you just stand? So I, 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 want, I want General Boykin to see this. How many Baptists are here? Stand up. All right, you may be how, many, how many Methodists are here? Stand up, Methodists. All right, you may be seated. How about Presbyterians? How about Episcopalians? Somebody said where there's four Episcopalians, there's bound to be a fifth. How many Catholics? Any Catholics? We usually have a bunch of those. How about uh, Assemblies of God? Okay. Yes. Okay. How about Church of God? How many Jews here? Hallelujah! <laughs> What to leave out? Church of Christ? What are the rest of you? <laughs> How many non-denominational do we have? <laughs> All right. That's great. I don't care what church you belong to, just as long as for Calvary you stand. Tonight... You're my brother. If, you're, if you know Jesus, you're my brother, so take me by the hand. It doesn't make any difference. Why. We're not here for, because of a denomination. We're because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, uh, I'll ask you a couple of questions. How many here have never in your whole life told a lie? How, how many have never stole anything? Well, General, we've got a bunch of liars and thieves here tonight for you to take care of. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a great honor to have General Boykin with us here tonight. He, he's a man I, I heard and, and I read his book, Never Surrender. It's one of the most encouraging books I've ever read. And I want to just try to tell you who he is. Have you seen him on TV? Anybody seen him? Yeah, a lot of you have. He's been in the news a number of times over the past. But the General Boykin was one of the original members of the U.S. Army's Delta Force. He was privileged to ultimately command uh, these uh, elite warriors in combat operations. Later, he commanded all the Army Green Berets that as well as the Special Warfare Center in the school. In his 36 years in the Army, uh, General Boykin also served at four years with the CIA. He, was, he has participated in clandestine operations around the world and served his last four years in the Army as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Today he is an ordained minister with a passion for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and encourage Christians to become warriors in God's kingdom. Give a welcome to General Jerry Boykin. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right, it's late. Do you guys know, did you hear that? You know what that is? That's the Marine Corps mating call. Huh? Let me see how many Marines we got. So this Marine got off of duty one afternoon. And he was one of those Episcopalians, so he went down to the bar. It was late at night. It was almost 10 o'clock at night. He walked in, sat down at the bar. And there was a television up over the bar. And it was almost time for the nightly news. And a Green Beret, an Army Green Beret, came in and sat down right next to him at the bar and looked over at him and said, Hey, uh, he said, hey, Marine. He said, how you doing? He said, I'm doing okay. Just came in to have a drink. About that time, the news came on. And when the news came on, there was a guy standing on the side of a building looking down at the cameras saying, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump and kill myself. So the Green Beret looked over at the Marine and said, you think he's going to jump? The Marine said, no way. The Green Beret pulled out a 20, laid it on the bar and said, I'll bet you 20. The Marine pulled out 20, laid it next to it and said, I'll take that bet. And about that time, the guy did a swan dive all the way to the pavement and killed himself. The Marine looked over to Green Beret and said, I can't believe I just lost 20 bucks on that. Well, fair is fair. And the Green Beret looked over at him and kind of smiled and said, say, man, said, I can't take your money. He said, I saw that on the 5 o'clock news. <laughs> Wait a minute. The Marine said, well, so did I, but I didn't think he'd be dumb enough to jump again. <laughs> now, here's my secret. I grew up around Cherry Point Marine Air Base. My dad was there for 33 years, and I loved the Marine Corps, and God bless you. Even though I spent uh, 36 years in the Army, I have a great respect for all the services, for all of you veterans, for all of you that have served this nation. Thank you so much. It was, uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I... Uh, I was surprised when I got here tonight to see how many people I knew that I've seen at other full gospel businessmen events. And uh, in fact, I have with me tonight uh, Jerry Bradley, a retired uh, Army Lieutenant Colonel himself, who is a member of the board of my ministry. My ministry is called Kingdom Warriors. And I call it Kingdom Warriors deliberately because I think that uh, it is time for us to understand that uh, as Christians, we're in a war. And uh, we've got to prepare ourselves, and we've got to fight. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that tonight. I was, uh, I had thought about talking to you, and I have my presentation about uh, the whole concept of uh, warfare, and then uh, I was asked to uh, give you my personal testimony, so I'm going to do that instead, and uh, we'll go where the Lord leads. But let me say a couple of things, first of all. Uh, what a wonderful thing to see. There, there must be a thousand men here tonight. What a wonderful thing to see men here on a Friday night worshiping the Lord. I, guys, I, I want to tell you this, and I say this with all humility. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to stand before this audience of godly men tonight. I just, I was so blessed just watching you worship. And I'm, I'm just not worthy to stand before you tonight. But I, thanks to Jimmy and to all of you who have allowed me to be with you tonight, it's a great honor. It's just a, it's a tremendous honor. As we were worshiping here with this wonderful worship team that is so talented and so blessed and so anointed. <laughs> as often happens, I was praying and I was praying in the Spirit and the, and the, the, the Holy Spirit laid on my heart to open my Bible and this happens to me occasionally. I opened my Bible 
and where I, I just where I opened it, I opened it to Matthew 10. And I have a message for somebody here tonight. I can't explain it. I don't understand the workings of the Holy Spirit, but I have a message for somebody here. And when I opened it, there were two scriptures marked here, and I want to just tell you what they are. And it's uh, Matthew 10, verse 5 and 6. It says, uh, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And in verse 16, it says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. I don't know who you are. But there's somebody in here tonight that the Lord is dealing with you about a mission. As somebody that the Lord is saying to you, go, and you have a, you've been captured by fear. And I believe that what the Lord is saying to you through these scriptures tonight is go. Go. And he will protect you. And he will bless you. And whoever you are, if you want to. Let me know after the service, but the Lord's dealing with somebody in here about going, and you're reluctant to go, so I just give you that scripture. I believe it's for you, and I believe it's what the Lord is saying to you tonight. I'm delighted to be with you. On the uh, 15th of October, 2003, Tom Brokaw on the nightly news aired a program that went something like this. He said, uh, he said, NBC News has learned that the Pentagon has a new three-star general. His name is Jerry Boykin. He's the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. His job is to find the enemies of America, Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, Zarqawi, Zawahiri, and all the other terrorist leaders. And it would appear that he would be the perfect man for this choice because he is a founding member of the Army's Delta Force. He served a tour at the Central Intelligence Agency. He's been involved in every conflict since Vietnam. Wounded twice in battle, a soldier's soldier. He chased Pablo Escobar through the jungles of Colombia and Manuel Noriega through the jungles of Panama. And he would appear to be the perfect man for this. However... Brokaw said. In a secret investigation, NBC News has learned that there's another side to this general that might disqualify him for this very important job, and that is that he is an evangelical Christian. (laughs) And he spat the words as if he were cursing me. And thus began the most difficult period of my life as I went through probably the the worst experience of my entire life. When I was investigated, I was hammered by the media. I was threatened by Islamic groups all over the Middle East. I'm still under threat today. And I really experienced a a very difficult situation. But I want to tell you about my faith. Because some of you, you need to be encouraged. I want to tell you about my faith. And I want to tell you something. I'm just as flawed as any man you have ever laid eyes on. I'm filled with the Spirit. I'm saved from the wretched life that I've lived in the past. I'm forgiven. Those things are as far as the east is from the west. But I want you to know that I've got every flaw that every man in here has. And more than many of you. But I want to tell you about my faith by giving you my personal testimony. On the uh, 6th of January, 1978, I just returned to Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, where I was an instructor in the ranger camp after spending the holidays up in eastern North Carolina with my family. And I got a call, and this guy on the other end said, uh, Captain Boykin, he said, I'm calling you from the Military Personnel Center in Washington, and I'm going to ask you to volunteer for an assignment in a very secret unit that's being formed right now at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. 
I didn't know at the time that it would ultimately become the Delta Force. He said, I can't tell you much about this unit. All I can tell you is that we're going to ask you to go to Fort Bragg and go through a 30-day trial. And during that trial, you'll need to be in the best physical condition that you've ever been in. And if you make it through this 30 days, we'll ask you to volunteer for this new unit that's being formed. It's very secretive, and that's all I can tell you about it. And by the way, I need your answer in two hours. Men, I did the thing that I always do when I'm confronted with that kind of dilemma, a tough decision to make, and you know what I did. I did what any self-respecting man would do. I called my mother. Now, let me tell you about my mother. My father, my father was my hero. He's, he's gone now, but he was my hero. Wounded on D-Day at Normandy. Godly man right before he died. But he wasn't at that stage of my life. I didn't grow up with a Christian father. But I saw him go into eternity praising God. As he died. But my mother was a godly woman. And I know my Pentecostal mother, who I've seen stand on her toes and praise the Lord, I knew that she could get a prayer through. And I called her up and said, Mom, I don't know what they're asking me to do here. I don't know what this is all about, but I want you to start praying for me that if whatever this is, if it's where God wants me to be, that he'll give me everything I need to get through whatever I've got to go through in the next 30 days. My mother began to pray for me right then on the phone. She hung up and she said, son, I'll be praying for you. I reported to Fort Bragg the first week of February. They issued us a bunch of equipment, took us straight into the mountains, dead of winter, snow everywhere. And then they put us out in those mountains with a very heavy rucksack on our back and a weapon in our hand, right by ourselves, each man by himself. And then we'd go mile after mile, day after day through those mountains right by ourselves, never knowing how far we had to go, never knowing when the day would end. And as I'd walk, I'd pray. One day I fell in a creek. My uh, pants and my boots and everything froze there. I lost all feeling. and I just had miles to go, and I just kept walking and praying, God, be with me. At the end of the day, I was fine. I got lost one day on top of a mountain, sat down, took my rucksack off, looked up into heaven, said, Jesus, I don't know where I am. Show me the way. Put my rucksack on and walked right to where I was supposed to be. And the last day in those mountains, amen, God's a pathfinder. In the last day in those mountains, we walked 40 miles. I made it in 11 hours and 27 minutes with about 70 pounds on my back. Through the mountains, in the snow, 11 hours and 27 minutes, I was the first man through. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now, guys. My wife thinks that I am a stud. <laughs> and I don't say anything to discourage her thinking that. <laughs> but I want you to know this. I ain't that much of a stud to do that on my own. To go that far with that much weight through the mountains in the snow in 11 hours and 27 minutes. And I probably, I probably ran almost half of it at a slow jog. Well, they got us back in, put us on trucks at the end of that 40 miles. And let me tell you something, guys. We started with 109 people. And at the end of that, we started 30 days before with 109 people. At the end of that 40 miles, there were 18 of us left. That's all that was left. They dropped every day. They put us on a truck, brought us back to Fort Bragg. They took us into a big auditorium, and they began to test us on every psychological test known to man. That this little... Uh, psychiatrist there just gave us all these tests and I it, got any psychiatrist in here psychologist psychiatrist anybody that deals with your head yes sir come up here and let us pray for you sir <laughs> we, will, we want to see you delivered from that evil okay <laughs> well when they got through testing us that little psychologist took me in the room there and sat down across the table from me and he looked at me and he said, Captain, I'm going to recommend against you being here in this new Delta Force. I said, why? He said, well, you're not self-reliant enough. I thought, I just walked 
40 miles with 70 pounds on my back and 11 miles and 27 minutes through the snow in the mountains. And this little fat rascal is sitting over here telling me <laughs> I'm not self-reliant enough. And I thought, you know what? I bet he relies on that nose and if I broke it for him, he'd have a real problem. <laughs> now hold on, that was before I was sanctified. <laughs> well, He said, I'm going to recommend against you being part of this unit. He said, uh, he said you're not self-reliant enough. He said, you, you rely too much on your faith. Well, I walked out of there, out of that office just saying, God, how can this be? You gave me the strength to get through this. You let me be first. How can this be? Well, that was a Friday afternoon. Monday morning, I was supposed to sit before a board of officers that would determine whether I was going to be part of this new Delta Force. It was the first time in 30 days we'd had any time off. I got in my vehicle and I drove to my home in eastern North Carolina where my mother was. Walked in, gave my mother a big hug, and I said, Mom, I know you've been praying for me. I said, what does the Lord telling you? What's in your heart? My mother looked me right in the eye and she said, Son, I do not know what this means. But she said, I'm going to tell you what have, has been revealed to me. She said, God has revealed to me that Satan is gathering his forces. Now, let me tell you something, especially all these young men that came up here. Satan is real. That's the first thing. You will not hear him preached about in churches. You may hear vague references to him, but he's real. He's a real enemy, and we're at war with him, and you better understand that. Don't trifle with him. He's real. But my mother said, Satan is gathering his forces, son. And she said, son, I don't know what it means. Well, that was Friday night. Sunday morning, before I went back to Fort Bragg, I went to that little old church that I grew up in. And it, it, that whole church isn't as big as just half of this middle section right here. One of them old churches out there in the country in North Carolina with wooden pews. You remember wooden pews? You ever try to sleep on a wooden pew, sir? That man, that's hard. That's why them Pentecostal preachers shout all the time. It's so hard to sleep. <laughs> but I'm telling you this. I got down on my knees that morning. You know what the Bible says in, Matthew, in, uh, in Jeremiah 29? It says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Sometimes you've got to be desperate to hear from the Lord. And sometimes you've got to just quit praying and listen. To hear from the Lord. Well, I got down on my knees and I said, God, Satan is gathering his forces. Jesus, what do I do? Satan is gathering his forces. And I'm just telling you how it happened. I heard the voice of the Lord. Nobody around me heard it. I heard the voice of the Lord. And I heard the voice of the Lord say, yes, son, but so am I. And I knew that I was to go back and be part of this new unit. The next morning, I reported back into Fort Bragg. I went in there and I sat down in this auditorium of and the old colonel that founded the Delta Force was a guy named Charlie Beckwith. Cantankerous, hard drinking, hard cursing, hard fighting. Old colonel, mean as a snake. In fact, this guy got shot in the belly in Vietnam with a 50 caliber and survived it. I mean, this guy was tough. And he sat there slobbering all over himself, about a three-day beard. And he had his officers around. And they were bombarding me with questions. And I was sitting there facing them, and they were just hammering me with these questions. There were no right and wrong answers. And all of a sudden, but I sat there in confidence, knowing God told me I was supposed to be here. And all of a sudden, old Charlie just stopped, and he said, everybody just stop. He said, Captain, you're a religious man, aren't you? And I thought, I'm going to hook that psychologist just as soon as I see him. <laughs> I'm telling you. So, well, I knew it was coming. I said, yes, Colonel, I am. And uh, he said, were you raised that way? I said, well, Colonel, I'll tell you, my mother was a saint. And uh, he just looked around for a minute, and he said, yeah, so was mine. He said, we'd be proud to have you in the Delta Force. And I thought, hey, dude, you're a day late. God told me yesterday I was going to be here. <laughs> well, let me tell you something, though. For the next two years, that guy treated me like I was a cancer or something. I thought the guy absolutely hated me, and I'm not joking. I thought he absolutely hated me. He 
held me to a higher standard than anybody else. But you know why? And I figured this out. Because a Christian had let him down. Somebody that talked to talk and didn't walk to walk had let him down. And he was looking for truth. And he wanted to see if I was really what I proclaimed that I was. He wanted to see if I could really live my faith. And he made life hard for me. But then, on the night of the 23rd of April, 1980, we stood in an old Russian MiG base in a place called Wadi Kenya, Egypt, getting ready to go into Tehran, Iran, and rescue 53 Americans that were being held by the Ayatollah Khomeini's student radicals at the American Embassy in Tehran. And old Charlie Beckwith came up to me and he said, Jerry, before we launch this operation, would you pray and ask God to go with us? You know what? I finally realized I'd passed his test. Whatever that was, I'd passed his test. And I said, Colonel, I'll do it. The next morning, I stood up on a platform just about this high gathered all these men around in that old Russian MiG base there in this hangar. And we read from the Bible, Isaiah 6, 8, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. You know, the Lord's still asking that question, Whom shall I send? That's the Lord's question, but the second one is your question, Who will go for us? Who will go for us? Well, we read from the Bible, and then we began to pray, and I led the prayer, and I said, God, in the name of Jesus, there's only a hundred of us here, and we're going into a city of five million people. We ask for your blessings upon us. We ask you to protect us and to bring us home to our families. In Jesus' name, and we sang, God bless America, and we got on our aircraft, and we launched. About 18 hours later... As we landed in the desert about 100 miles from Tehran, we came in in C-130s and landed and, and uh, uh, helicopters, RH-53s, came off the USS Nimitz to link up with us there. And uh, we all got together there in the desert. We uh, refueled our helicopters. We stretched hoses out the back of the C-130s, <coughs> plugged them into the helicopters, and we started refueling. And one of the crews, as they tried to lift off and move away after they got through refueling, they kicked up a bunch of dust, and the pilot went vertigo because of the dust and the dark and the confusion. And all of a sudden, he lost it, and he lost his equilibrium, and he crashed right over into the C-130. And I'm telling you, I was, I was uh, probably from here to that door from it. I was walking up to it when the thing crashed and exploded and it exploded into a huge ball of fire. It's nothing but just a big ball of fire. You couldn't even tell it was two aircraft. All it was was just a huge ball of fire in the desert. And I turned to run, and as I turned to run, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Stop! Stop! And I turned and looked back, and that's when I realized that 45 of those men that had stood there in that desert in Wadi Kenya, Egypt, and prayed for God to be with us, were hopelessly trapped inside that burning wreckage. And they were going to die. And there was absolutely nothing that I could do. And as I stood there in horror, realizing that those men were going to die, I began to call out in the name of Jesus. And I said, Jesus, in Jesus' name, spare them. God, don't let these men die. God, don't let them die. In Jesus' name, don't let them die. They trusted you, God. Don't let them die. And I'm telling you, all of a sudden, the right troop door on that C-130 opened, and right through the flames came 45 men in a dead run, just running. Yeah. Amen. 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 It's like that story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And old Nebuchadnezzar jumped up and ran over and looked in there and said, Yo, dudes, I think we threw Thea in there, but I see four. And the fourth one looks like the Son of God. Well, I know the Son of God was walking about in that fire with those men that night. I saw a miracle. You see, Tom Brokaw didn't understand that. He can criticize my faith. He can talk about this 
radical evangelical that thinks that God talks to him or believes Satan is real. He doesn't understand my faith. He wasn't there that night. He didn't see that. In 1983, the president told us to go into the island of Grenada, a beautiful Caribbean island with beautiful people that had been taken over by the Cubans and the communists. President Ronald Reagan said, you go in there and take that island away from those people. You rescue a thousand American medical students that were literally being held hostage there and bring them home to American soil. As we got ready to launch that operation out of our base at Fort Bragg, one of those sergeants that had been trapped inside that burning wreckage came up to me and he walked up and he looked me right in the eye. I just saw this guy about three months ago in Colorado Springs. His name is Nick Nickel. He walked up to me and he said, Major Boykin, we ain't leaving until you pray. I said, I said, yes, yes. I got up on the loading dock there in the old Delta compound, and we gathered all our men around, put our arms around each other's shoulders, and a lot of these guys were guys that were trapped inside that burning wreckage. And there's a lot of new guys who put our arms around each other's shoulders and we began to pray. God, go with us. God, keep us in your hands and bring us home to our families in Jesus' name. And then we sang, God bless America. And we got on our helicopters and we launched. The next morning, we uh, came across the beautiful blue waters of the Caribbean. I was in the Caribbean last week down in the same place. I, first, really the first time I've been back in the Caribbean since 1983. And in fact, that's what's wrong with my face. I got too much sun. My wife and I were out there uh, on a cruise last week. And it, it was just, I, I'd look at the uh, weather back here in uh, the East Coast <laughs> every morning on the news. And then I'd go out and lay out there on the deck. Well, I got a little too much sun, so I got a little sun poison here, but we came across that beautiful blue water of the Caribbean onto the island of Grenada just as the sun was coming up over the horizon and the beautiful people down there were waving through the jungle and all, and all of a sudden, here we are. There's our target. I see it. It's a prison. It's called Richmond Hill Prison. There were political prisoners in there. We were going in on that prison. We were going to rescue these political prisoners. And as we started in, I started seeing stuff that didn't look right. And all of a sudden, I realized it was red and green tracers coming at us from every direction. And then I heard a popping sound. And it was the tracers going through the rotor blades. And we were coming in hot. And I said, it's going to be a bad landing. And all of a sudden, it felt like somebody hit me with a two before. Boom, boom. And I realized that I'd just been hit. I got a big gaping hole up in the side of my chest. The doctor's... Uh, said it, it didn't penetrate the lung, and then I, I got shot right up through the armpit. I mean, literally right through the armpit. And part of it came out the top of my shoulder, and the rest of it stayed in there. And uh, we made another pass, went back in, got shot out a second time, and so they headed out to sea, and they went out and landed on a carrier. And uh, they immediately took me down, took me into surgery, operated on me, uh, brought me out of surgery, put me on an aircraft, flew me all the way back to Fort Bragg. Just as soon as I got off the plane, they took me right into surgery a second time. And uh, I had no use of my arm. I thought my arm had been shut off when I first got hit. In fact, I reached over to stop the bleeding and realized, my goodness, I still got my arm. And I laid it across my lap like this, and it was just, it was nothing to it. Well, I came out of surgery a second time, and when I woke up, here's this team of surgeons and nurses, and they're standing around looking at me. And this is what they said to me. They said, sir, you have a serious injury. And I said, say it ain't so. I got a softball-sized hole in the side of my chest, no armpit, and can't use my arm. And that's all they can tell me? You got a serious injury. <laughs> they said, listen, they said uh, the bone in your arm right at the shoulder, the humerus, has been completely pulverized. It's, it's not just broke, it's shot in two. It's splintered into hundreds of pieces. And they said, you're never going to use your arm again. They said, the, the problem is not the bone. They said, in six to eight months, we can go back in and put a plate in there and, and sort the bone out. 
But they said the problem is the nerve's gone in your arm. You're never going to use it again. I found out years later they actually wanted to take my arm off. A doctor friend of mine told me that. And, he, and he's the one that, in fact, he lives over in Columbus right now. Uh, and, and there's a, a doctor in the Houston Sports Medicine Clinic over there. I was just with him back in October. And uh, he said, uh, I told him, don't even ask him. He'll never agree to let you take his arm off. So they didn't ask me. But they said, you're never going to use that arm again. And uh, I looked at him in faith because the Holy Spirit impressed this upon me. The Holy Spirit said to me, if you'll trust me, I'll heal you. And I looked at the doctors then and I said, just do the best you can. You'll never go in my arm again. God's going to heal me. And, of course, they said, well, you certainly do have a good attitude, sir. <laughs> Listen, I had people laying hands on me, people praying for me, people lifting me up. I had people all over praying for me. They said, you're never going to heal. Well, let me tell you something about never going to heal. That's the arm that they wanted to take off. Now, I'm 61 years old. And on my birthday every year, I take my wife in there, and I'm telling you, she's knockout gorgeous. She's a beautiful woman. I wouldn't bring her down here to an event like this for anything. <laughs> but I take her in there, and we rack up 300 pounds, and I bench press 300 pounds on my birthday. I only do it once a year because it hurts me too bad. But <laughs> look, what's my point? That's the arm they were going to take off. You think Brokaw understands that? You think Tom Brokaw understands that? You think he ever went through anything like that? No. Let me tell you something, guys. You look at the arm. You see us shorter than the other one? He says, you think that's a handicap? You guys that have a bad slice, take a half inch off your left arm and you'll have the <laughs> best hook. I'm telling you, it works. 1989. The president told us in 1989 to go into Panama and take that country away from a Satan worshiper named Manuel Noriega. He said, go in there and protect the Americans that are in that place and take that country away and turn it back over to the people that were elected. As we got ready to launch that operation out of Howard Air Force Base there in the Canal Zone, I got up on a platform. We gathered all our men around. And we began to pray. We said, God, in Jesus' name, go with us. Keep us in your hands and protect us. Bring us home to our families in Jesus' name. Amen. Then we sang, God bless America. And we got in our helicopters and we lifted off. And our first mission was to go into a prison there called Carcel Modelo Prison and rescue an American named Kurt Muse. And Kurt Muse has got a wonderful book out called uh, six minutes to freedom about our rescue of him. And uh, Kurt's a wonderful Christian man. And uh, we were supposed to rescue him. And we lifted off and we headed out across that canal. And when we crossed that canal, I'm telling you, the red tracers and the green tracers were coming at us. And all I could think of was, not again, not again. But they were coming at us. And we dug down under the tracers. We put a helicopter in right on top of the prison, blew a hole in the top of the prison, got down into the third floor where Kurt Muse was located. A couple of guys ran down the hallway, blew the door off his cell. We got Kurt Muse out, took him back up to the roof, put him on one of these little bitty Hughes 530 helicopters, little thing with people sitting on the outside of the helicopter with these pods that lay down and they, they sit on the outside and strap themselves in, put Kurt Muse on the inside, took off, lifted off the top of the prison and started out across Panama City and started taking fire and all of a sudden the helicopter crashed, bam, right in the middle of the street. Well, it should have killed everybody on that helicopter. One guy got hit in the leg with an AK round, another guy got hit in the chest with an AK round. The helicopter crashed on another guy's foot and cut his toes off, cut three of his toes off. And another guy jumped out of the crash and started running and the rotor blades came around and hit him right in the head and knocked him right out in the street. and. Everybody thought he was dead. But I'm telling you guys, every one of those guys recovered completely and went back to work. Every single one of them. T 
Tom Brokaw and the NBC News don't understand that. They don't understand that. See, to them, faith is just a word. It has no substance. It has no meaning. Their faith is in something other than the God that I serve, than the God that we all serve. In 1993, in August, the end of August, the President, Bill Clinton, told us to go into a place called Mogadishu, Somalia. You know of this by the movie and the book Black Hawk Down. We were to go in there and capture a a warlord named Muhammad Faria Deed. He was the leader of the Habegeter clan. Uh, Muhammad Faria Deed had, had uh, done everything he could to take absolute and total control of the entire nation of Somalia, starting in the capital city of Mogadishu. And his militia was brutal. And in one operation, he killed... 24 Pakistani peacekeepers that were doing nothing but feeding hungry people with United Nations relief aid. And when that happened, the United Nations said, go get him and take him to trial. We landed in Mogadishu. We got off the aircraft in Mogadishu on the airfield there. And let me tell you something. I felt the presence of evil. I felt the presence of evil. And I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but you know how you feel God's Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit's in here. You feel the Holy Spirit. I felt the presence of evil. They're spirits too, you know. They're spirits. And I felt the presence of evil, and I knew it was an evil place. And uh, I had a little Baptist chaplain with me, and I said, you go over there and you set up a little chapel. We're going to start having church services here. And uh, I really began to pray for God's protection upon these men. And that little chaplain started sharing the gospel and having church services and worshiping the Lord. And then right before we got, we launched our first operations, we got everybody together and, and we began to pray, God, go with us. God, keep us in your hands. Protect us in Jesus' name. And then we saying, God bless America. And we began to launch our operations into the city of Mogadishu. Listen, guys. The problem with the movie Black Hawk Down, you only see one day's operations. We went in that city six times, and we got in some tough fights. And I'll tell you, since there's a men's audience here, you know, we killed a lot of people in there. I'm not proud of that. I'm just telling you, we got in some tough fights. And, uh, but let me tell you, in six times going into that city, we'd come out of that city every time with just unscathed. I think we had two guys that got a Band-Aid on their leg, and that was it. And every time we'd come back out of that city after some tough fights where a lot of people got killed, I'd give God the glory. I'd say, Lord, thank you. Jesus, thank you. I'd rejoice and I'd give God the glory. And then on the 3rd of October, there's a beautiful Sunday morning and it was my mother's birthday. And I was trying to figure out how I could uh, call my mother on her birthday from Mogadishu to say happy birthday, mom. And we started getting intelligence that a bunch of Adid's lieutenants his closest advisors, were having a meeting in a place uh, called the Bakara Market. It was the worst part of Mogadishu. It was the heart of the Habergitter clan. It was a place we did not want to go, and we had intentionally avoided going into that area. But the intel was good, and suddenly we got the order to launch. And right before I ordered the launch of that operation, I did what I did before every operation. I got down on my knees right in front of everybody, right there in the operation center. I got down on my knees and I just said, God, we need you now. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. And then I got up. The the code word to launch that operation was Irene. I picked up the handset and I said into that handset three times, Irene, Irene, Irene. And the rotor blades started turning out on the airfield and the the noise began to increase and the dust increased and finally all those helicopters lifted off that airfield. They went out over the ocean, made one pass over the ocean so they could get lined up and then they headed inbound to the Bacara market. And after... Ten minutes after I said, Irene, 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 we had 99 soldiers fighting for their lives 
against tens of thousands of armed Somalis. Many military experts have said that it is the most intense combat that the United States has seen since World War II. And for 18 hours, we fought for our lives. And 18 hours after I said, Irene, 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 15 of my soldiers were dead. And I watched on a little black and white television about this size. As CNN International showed the bodies of five of those 15 being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu and mutilated and desecrated. And my heart was broken. And all I could say was, God, where are you? God, where are you? Where are you, God? My most vivid memory of Mogadishu, and I tell people this wherever I speak and give my testimony, my, my most vivid memory was bringing a five-ton truck back in on the airfield out of that fight the next morning right after sunrise. And it's all we had to bring our dead and wounded out with. The dead were on the bottom of that five-ton truck and the wounded were stacked up on top of the dead. And I walked over to help lower the tailgate on that truck. And somebody got to it ahead of me and they dropped that tailgate and when it slammed, the blood poured out the back of it like water. And as I stood there, watching and smelling the copper smell of the blood of my soldiers, all I could say was, God, where were you? Where were you, God? We got our wounded and our dead evacuated and got everybody sort of taken care of. And that night, just as the sun went down, I hadn't slept in really in two days. And I went over and I sat down on my bunk where no one could see me. I sat down on my bunk and I began to pray and I said, God, where were you? Where were you? And my anger began to build. And then I began to weep. And as I wept, my anger grew even more intense. And pretty soon my chest was heaving and I was weeping uncontrollably saying, God, where were you? Until finally I said this. I said, there is no God. There's no God. For if there was a God, he would have never let this happen. He would have heard my prayers. There's no God. But let me tell you something. The moment I said, there's no God. For the second time in my life. And quite frankly, the last time that it's happened to me. I heard the voice of the Lord. I heard him speak. And he said, if there's no God, there's no hope. And I want you to think about that. That's a pretty simple statement. But I heard the voice of the Lord say, if there's no God, there's no hope. And I immediately said, God, I am so sorry. I repent. Forgive me, God, for doubting you. Listen, there's a message that people need to hear, and that's this. There's nothing you've ever done that God will not forgive you for. There's a guy in the Bible named Peter that denied him three times, and the book of Acts says he preached a sermon that won 3,000 people to the gospel. I denied him one time, but I denied him not in my heart. I denied him in my head. I said, there's no God but when he said, if there's no God, there's no hope, I said, God, forgive me. And you know something? I was forgiven that quickly. There's nothing you've ever done that God won't forgive you for. And that's a message people need to hear. Because people are carrying guilt. Christians are carrying guilt. 
when you confess your sins, they are gone. They are gone. And I said, but God, I don't understand. I don't understand what happened here. God, I don't understand. You ever been in that situation? You ever been to the point where you say, God, if you're real, if you care, if you hear my prayer, how can this happen? How can this bad thing, this evil thing, this incorrigible event, how can that happen? How can 200,000 people die in an earthquake in Haiti? Well, I picked up my Bible. And I said, God, I'm just going to open it. And I'm going to trust that wherever I open it, you'll give me something that will help me. I opened my Bible. I looked down, and this is what it said. It said, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. And lean not into thine own understanding. That's exactly the page I opened it to. Proverbs 3, 5. Yeah. There are things that you and I cannot understand because we do not have the mind of God. There are things we cannot understand. But it was said earlier, all things work together for good. Well, I said, okay, God, it's not for me to understand. The next day we had a memorial service. That night after the, we, after the memorial service, the sun had just gone down. I'm standing on the airfield, and I'm talking to two of my soldiers. I'm standing here, and a master sergeant and a lieutenant colonel, and all of a sudden there's a huge explosion. We're just standing on the airfield, and there's this huge explosion, and it, and it occurred right there. And they were between me and the explosion. It turned out to be a mortar. Four mortars were fired at us. Three of them went all the way across the airfield and landed in the ocean, but one mortar, for you old army guys, was a short round, and it landed right there. And it knocked us all down. We all went down. I was told that I was knocked out for just, I guess, probably seconds. I stood to my feet and I looked down at my master sergeant. Literally, I saw his brains laying on the ground. And I began to cry out to God, no, God. No, I can't take it anymore. You've got to stop this. You ever been there? You ever done that? God, I... I can't take it anymore. If you can't change the situation, then take me. Take me out of it. I've done that a few times. I'm screaming at God, no God. No God, no more. Well, they took me up to a, a little field hospital, which is really nothing but a bunch of tents. They operated on me that night. I'd been hitting the legs and the feet, and they got the shrapnel some of it out and the rest of it they just left in there and the next morning as the sun came up I said just take me back to the airfield get me back down there with the troops so they took me back I couldn't do anything but lay on my bed so I just laid on my bunk an army bunk army cot I just laid on a cot and I was just praying God I know it's not for me to understand but give me something that will help me that will soothe my pain that will encourage me and somebody walked up and handed me a facsimile. And the facsimile started in uh, Loveland, Colorado. It was the guy that founded the Dollar Rental Car Company, a wonderful Christian man. <clears throat> and he had sent this fax to Fort Bragg, and they forwarded it on to me. And I looked at this fax, and you know what that fax said? It said, For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, 31. For they that wait upon the Lord. That means for they that hope in the Lord. For they that hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. And I was encouraged. I came home the end of October. My first night home I couldn't sleep. I was just tormented. At 2.30 in the morning, I got up and walked downstairs, picked up my Bible, and I just said, God, 
I am tormented because I do not believe that those men that died in Mogadishu were ready to meet you. I don't believe they were ready to go. I said, I'm going to open my Bible and I want you to give me something that will help me ease my pain. In Jesus' name. And I opened my Bible. And I opened it to Romans 5.19. And it says this. For as by one man's disobedience were many made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now that's talking about Jesus at the cross. He paid the price that we could all have hope for eternity. But what God was saying to me through that scripture that morning at 2.30 in the morning in my pain was he was saying, Jerry Boykin, were you obedient to me in Mogadishu? Did you share the gospel with those men? Did they hear the gospel? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And I felt the Holy Spirit saying to me, I revealed myself to those men. I gave them an opportunity to receive me before they died. And I believe they accepted Jesus before they died. I said, God, just confirm this for me. I closed the Bible. I said, God, confirm it. Confirm it for me in Jesus' name. And I opened my Bible, and it was the book of John, John 40. And it said this, Said I not to thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God. What's the glory of God that I will see? I believe I'll see 16 men again when we cross the Jordan. I'm finishing with this, and some of you know this story. You've either heard me tell it before, or you've read my book, and I'll be signing books in the back here. I won't be with you tomorrow. I've got to go to Los Angeles tomorrow morning, so I'll be signing books in the back if you want to get one. But I, this, this is in the book. This story is in the book. But I tell you this story for a very important reason. When that mortar went off, and it knocked me down, and I stood to my feet. I immediately began to scream, find Dr. Marsh. Find Dr. Marsh. He's the, he was the unit surgeon. Find Dr. Marsh. I didn't know it, but Dr. Marsh was laying right next to me in a pool of blood. He had walked up to speak to me, and when that mortar went off, the blast hit him, and it hit him right in the, in the groin and severed his renal artery. Now, for those of you in the medical field, you know that's a serious injury. Severed his renal artery right here. And he went down and he was unconscious. They came along with two litters and they picked us up and they put me on a litter and they put him on a litter. And they brought us into this little tent that was no bigger than this area right here where they had medical personnel setting up. And they laid us side by side on the two litters and he was much more severely wounded than I was. He was in jeopardy of dying. But they laid us side by side, and I reached over and just took a hold of his hand, and his hand was limp. And I, I took his hand, and I said, Rob, you hold on, buddy. You're going to make it. And then I began to pray, God, uh, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to spare this man's life. I ask you to let him live. In Jesus' name, don't let him die. They hooked up a blood pressure machine and a heart monitor, and I began to watch them, and they began to just tick away. And I saw him losing blood pressure, and I saw his heart rate dropping. I just said, God, don't let him die in Jesus' name. And I said, Rob, I'd look over at him, I'd say, Rob, you hold on, buddy. Hold on, and I'd squeeze his hand, but he didn't squeeze back. Rob, hold on. Jesus, don't let him die. God, in the name of Jesus, don't let him die. I watch those machines, and they're just going right on down, right on down. And all of a sudden, I can't explain it, but he just opened his eyes. Big old dilated eyes. I remember it like it was yesterday. He opened those big old dilated eyes, and he looked over at me, and he said, he said, tell Barbara I love her. His eyes rolled back, his lids closed, and he was gone. He zeroed out. No blood pressure and no pulse. And the nurse said to me, sir, let him go. He's gone. <laughs> Held on to that limp hand. 
said, God, I don't care what those machines say. God, don't you let him die. Don't let him die. Don't let him die. In Jesus' name. Man, I'm telling you, today that man's raising four children and practicing medicine. That's right. We serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. And uh, Tom Brokaw didn't understand that. We serve a mighty God. Folks, you see what's happening to our world. You see what's happening to our nation. You see what's happening to our families. You see what's happening to our churches. And it's not a pretty sight. But I know this. As long as there's a remnant. As long as there's a remnant. That will reach out and rattle the gates of heaven. There's a chance for this country. There's a chance for our families. There's a chance for this world. I'm asking you to do something tonight. We started a program we call Take Ten. And I'm asking you, every one of you to pray for America for 10 minutes a day. I don't care if you do it in one minute increments. Pray for America for 10 minutes a day. You just like I reached out and grabbed a hold of the hand of a dying man. You reach out and you grab a hold of the hand of the master and you hold on and you keep praying. You never cease. The name of my book is Never Surrender and that's for a reason. Never surrender. Never surrender. You keep praying because our God is bigger than any problem and any trouble in this world. He's coming soon, but he told us to tarry. He didn't tell us to go sleep. And we're in a battle, and we've got to stay in that battle. We've got to put our armor on, and we've got to fight till he comes back. You can't do that sitting on the pews of the churches. You learn there. You get mentored there. You get blessed there. You get filled with the Holy Spirit there. But then you take everything that he's given you and you get back out there in the battle. And your battleground is where you work. Your battleground's in your home. Your battleground is the places where God allows you to be. Where there are people that need to hear the gospel. There are people that need to hear truth. And they're not hearing it today. They're not going to hear it from the media. And I'm sad to say they're not going to hear it in a lot of churches. But they need to hear it from you. I'm going to ask you right now, everybody bow your head. Guys, I, I'm, I'm done, but I'm not going to walk out of here until I am obedient to God. And I'm going to just ask you right now, I want everybody's head bowed. And all, and close your eyes and be praying. Saints, be praying. Is there anybody in here that has not asked Christ into your life? I want you to show me your hand right now. I ain't going to embarrass you. I want you to show me your hand right now. If there's anybody in here that has not asked Jesus into your soul, you've not confessed your sins, you've not been saved, you've not come into a relationship with Christ. I'm telling you, don't. there's absolutely nothing you've ever done that he won't forgive you for right now. Okay, yes, sir. All right. Any others? We got any others here that have any others? Show me your hand quickly. Okay. Here's what we're going to do with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. I want you to pray this prayer with me. All every man in here, I want you to pray this prayer with me out loud right now. Say it with me. Heavenly Father, I confess my sins. I know I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me and receive me into your kingdom. Lord, I thank you for saving me. I accept your forgiveness. I accept your grace. And I thank you, God, for the promise of eternity. In Jesus' name. All right, men, look up at me. Now I'm going to ask you one last thing. 
Give us some music here, guys. Is there anybody in here tonight that either has something you want somebody to pray for you about or you want to receive this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Now, I grew up around it, and I don't understand it. I do not understand. I can't explain it to you. I can't teach you how to, how to pray in tongues. I don't understand it. All I know is I do it. But I don't understand it. But don't be afraid of it. If there's somebody in here tonight that you're ready to receive this free gift, nobody's going to teach you how to do it. They can't do it. But they can pray with you and ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if you've got a prayer need, a prayer request, I want you to come up here and get these prayer warriors right there. I know there's two of them right there, these prayer warriors. That these men, when they lay their hands on you and pray for you, they're going to move heaven. So guys, come on up here. Come on up here. Come on right here to the front. If you've got a request, come on up here and let these men pray for you. Where's Jimmy and the rest of the guys? Let's get some guys down here to, to pray for these men that are coming forward that have a request. If you've got anything, uh, you need healing, you need financial, you need relational, come on up here and let somebody pray with you right now. I need you, Jesus, to come to my heart.